Good morning, friends, and welcome to the worship service for the Gathering United Methodist Church. I'd like to begin by reading to you from a passage of Scripture. But the Lord rules forever. He assumes His throne for the sake of justice. He will establish justice in the world rightly. He will judge all people fairly. The Lord is a safe place for the oppressed, a safe place in difficult times. Those who know your name trust you because you have not abandoned any who seek you, Lord. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for who you are because each of us has found a safe place in you. We thank you, Lord, for the love and the mercy that you bring to our lives. And as we worship, Lord, allow us to come into your presence with singing. Amen. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Friends, as we come to our time of prayer this morning, I do not have any specific persons who have been lifted up. As always, I like to remember those whose churches have disaffiliated, but they've chosen to remain United Methodist. So let's just pause now for this time of prayer. Oh God, we give you thanks for the mothers and the fathers of our faith. And we know that includes biblical mothers and fathers, historical mothers and fathers, biological mothers and fathers, and persons who are in our church who help raise us, and persons who have been a father or a mother to us. Help us, Lord, to be molded and shaped by the faithful teachings of their lives. And Lord, we especially thank you for the fathers of our faith. Lord. Help us to hear when you call upon us. And help us, Lord, to welcome your spirit and to make this journey with you so that we might be a part of something which is greater. Help us, Lord, not only to serve you, but help us, God, to pass down the faith to each and every generation. Lord, help us in these days to know that you, God, will be faithful to us. And help us, Lord, to have the courage to be your disciples. Lord, we especially want to remember this day those whose churches have disaffiliated, but they've chosen to remain United Methodist. We know, Lord, that many have found congregations, and we thank you for that. But we pray, Lord, for those who are still in transition. We pray, O oh God, that they would not feel excluded or isolated from you or from the church. We pray, O oh God, that you would guide them and lead them to places where they can worship and where they can serve as, as well. And we pray, O oh God, that you can begin something new in their lives, that you can remind them that you have never left them nor forsaken them, but that you continue to surround them and embrace them with your love and that you, uh, Lord, still have an important, very, a very important purpose for their lives. O oh God, we... We thank you, Lord, for the good God that you are, because even in the most difficult times, you offer us mercy and love. And all these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our scripture lesson for today comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the very first chapter. I'm going to begin with verse 18, and I'm going to go through verse 25. And as always, I invite you to listen for God's word. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us, and some translators say God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as as an angel from God, commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave a birth to her son. Joseph called him Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God, and let us join together in saying, thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I goofed. I made a little bit of a mistake in uh, preaching with my Southern Hills United Methodist congregation and brought with me today uh, my Father's Day sermon. But because I didn't do one of those last week for you, I thought you might appreciate this. But if you've already had a Father's Day sermon and you're wondering if there's anything more in this passage, I want to tell you that this goes with uh, my sermon series because we're talking about an unexpected journey an unexpected call that is placed upon the life of a man named Joseph. So I invite you this day, however you want to hear this, to just simply to listen to the scriptures and to be reminded um, that we are God's own and that God has called us this day. Let us pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable, not to one another, but to you. Amen. When I was thinking about what I wanted to say on Father's Day, I figured it would be really easy because there are so many examples in the Bible. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but the context of both the Old Testament and the New Testament are scriptures that took place in a patriarchal culture and male imagery abounds. However, when I got to looking at passages which talked about fathers and their sons or daughters or their children and their relationship and perhaps maybe something that happened uh, in that journey or in their life together, I actually did not find that many passages. So I went to the beginning of the book of Matthew and I found somebody called Joseph. Now, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible entitles this particular passage, The Birth of Jesus the Messiah. But I think it could have also been entitled something else. And I know that it's a dream, but it seems to me to be a heart-to-heart -heart talk between an angel and Joseph about the fact that he's going to be the father of this Messiah. The Bible tells us that when Joseph discovered that Mary was pregnant, he was shocked because in those days, whenever you had the announcement of a pregnancy outside of a marriage, it was considered a disgrace. We can also conclude that Joseph was confused. Um, <clears throat> even though the Bible says that the child was conceived by the Holy Spirit, I think it is safe for us to assume that prior to Joseph's dream, he did not know this. And yet, in the midst of all of the shock and the confusion, something beautiful happened. 
Mary gave birth to this child, and she and Joseph became parents of the one that God sent to save us. I find it is always amazing how even though God is the one who brings wonderful miracles to our lives, there are always faithful people surrounding those things that happen. Friends, I have entitled my uh, sermon for today, The Faith of Our Fathers, because I believe that it is both our fathers and mothers who have brought us to the place where we are in terms of our own faith journey. And that includes biblical fathers like Moses, historical fathers like John Wesley, and biological fathers like your father and my father, and also persons who have perhaps been a father to us. And so we are thankful this day for those persons and the ways that they have influenced in our lives. One of the first things that it says in our scripture lesson for today is that Joseph was a righteous man. And the Greek word here implies that he was one who knew and studied the Torah. So Joseph wasn't just a carpenter. He was a member of the community of faith. In fact, I think the writer of this scripture passage makes this the whole context of the chapter. Lots of times we will read the Gospel of Matthew and start at um, the first chapter and we will get bogged down in this genealogy that traces uh, Jesus and his birth all the way back to King David. And I think that's very important. But I decided that I would just take a step back and look at this and see this as faithful people, faithful men of God who have passed down the faith from one generation to the next. And folks, what this implies here is that men are called to be people of God just as much as women are. Now this may seem strange to you, but several years ago, I was reading the newsletter column of another pastor here in Oklahoma City, and he was talking about United Methodist men. And this is what he wrote. He said, men need to be encouraged and supported as spiritual people. And he made that statement because in today's society, many men are not encouraged to that. In fact, that's one of the things that I like about the people of the gathering and, and something that I also like about the people at our Southern Hills Church is that there are many men, and they are not just leaders or hold chair uh, positions, but they are also disciples of Jesus Christ. Not all churches in our conference have such participation because many men are not comfortable with spiritual matters, nor are they encouraged to be. In one of my previous churches, when I inquired one day about Methodist men, and I asked basically something like, do we have a men's group that meets for breakfast, maybe studies the Bible, or perhaps maybe they come together around a project of some kind, I was told that church was women's business. And I was sad because I believe that men have so many gifts to offer. In our scripture lesson for today, Joseph is a good father. The Bible says that when he discovered that Mary was pregnant, he intended to dismiss her quietly. And friends, that does not mean he was trying to avoid responsibility. In that day, an engagement was legally binding, unlike today. And according to the law, Joseph had a choice. He could declare in court that Mary was pregnant, testify that he was not responsible for that, and be granted a divorce or privately in the presence of two witnesses, he could issue a writ declaring their legal separation. So we can conclude that Joseph's dismissal of Mary intended to end their relationship without public humiliation. In other words, he had Mary's best interest in mind. However, and this is many times how God can be in our lives, God had a different plan. God called Mary to give birth to Jesus, but God also called Joseph. And I want to read again these two verses in the Bible, these words that the, the angel says to him. The scripture says, as he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. 
she will give birth to a son, and you shall call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Friends, God is reminding Joseph that he is being called to be a part of something that is greater than himself. And you know, that's kind of true of all of us. Just as we are born of human beings, we are also born of God. Each of us has a dual citizenship here on earth and in the city of God. Each of us belongs to two families, our immediate family that we call our home and our family of God, which we call the church. And what that means is that all of us, men and women, are called to something greater that is beyond ourselves. And if we are called to that greater thing, which I believe is the testimony of the scripture, God also reminds us that God will walk with us every step of the way. It is an unexpected journey. And Joseph's calling was an unexpected journey. But God also promised to be with him. And he asked him just simply to trust God. Many years ago, I came across a story by a pastor named Robert Allen. Robert was a pastor here at Wesley United Methodist Church in Oklahoma City for 15 years. He pastored other churches in the Oklahoma Conference. And I got to serve under him for about three years. Later, he went on to Wichita Falls, Texas, but he was diagnosed with cancer, and not too long after that, he passed away. But I can still remember a story that he wrote one time in a newsletter article, and it was a story about a young girl who went to visit her grandparents. And on the very first day, the grandfather announced that he wanted to go for a walk. And being curious, this little girl asked if she could go along with him, which, of course, he was glad to allow her to, to do that. After they'd walked for about 15 minutes, the grandfather decided he would tease her a little bit. So he said to her, well, how far do you think we are from home? And the little girl said, I, I don't know. And he said, well, which way do you think we ought to go to get back? And again, this little girl said, I, I don't know. And with a glint in his eye, he looked at his granddaughter and he said to her, well, it sounds to me like you're lost. But this girl was sharp. She looked at her grandfather and she took a hold of his hand and she said, Grandpa, I'm not lost. I'm with you. Friends, let us remember that the one who has called us is the one that we make a journey with. And God has promised to be with us always as long as we stay on the right path and follow his direction. God just simply calls us to be obedient. Now when Joseph received his dream, he married Mary and he cared for her in her pregnancy. Some people say that they lived in poverty. I don't know that that was necessarily true, but I know that they probably did not have a lot. So having a baby was a big deal in their lives. It was going to change a lot of things. They were gonna to have to trust God in a lot of different ways. When they traveled to Bethlehem, he took Mary. She was riding probably on a donkey and he was walking. And it was 80 miles that they journeyed from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Many people of those days or, or accounts of those days say that it probably took them two to three days to make that journey. When there was no room at an inn for them to stay, Joseph pleaded with the innkeeper to, to allow um, them to stay in a stable. And eight days after Jesus' birth, they went to the temple to present him to God. And here's the part that wasn't in the job description. You remember Herod sought Jesus, and he asked the wise men to tell him where Jesus was after they had gone and visited him. But an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And he told him to take Mary and the baby and to go to Egypt. And it was a good thing that he listened because when the wise men don't return back to King Herod, he goes into a fit of rage and he has all of the male children, two years of age and under in Bethlehem and the surrounding area murdered. I can only imagine what Joseph must have been thinking. But courageously, one day he decided to return back home. But as he was coming home, um, he learned that 
Herod had died, but that his son had come to power, and he did not know what his intentions were. So it is then that he turned north, and he went into the region of Galilee to his hometown of Nazareth, and that's where they settled. That's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem and why he was raised in Nazareth. But in all those situations, Joseph showed that even though he was a little reluctant at first and didn't understand what was going on, that he was willing to obey God. And what it seems to me like is that it appears that the beginning of being a good father is to be an obedient child. What that means is that we have to get to know God's voice. Richard Foster says that the best way to get to know God's voice is to read these words carefully and to allow them to speak to us and then to do what they tell us to do. And that as we read the scriptures and that as we practice what it teaches us, we will come to know this voice inside of us that speaks to us, that calls us, that warns us, that guides us, that encourages us, and that strengthens us for the journey ahead. Many years ago, there was a story about a man who um, uh, was facing open heart surgery. He had never been hospitalized before, so understandably he was upset and he was fearful. He felt like Joseph, as if he were in unfamiliar territory. But the night before, a nurse entered his room and told him that she would be with him in his recovery. And then she took his hand and she asked him to take hers. And then she said to him, I want you to hold my hand and I want you to know my voice. This seemed kind of strange to the man, but he did as she asked. And then she said this. She said, tomorrow during surgery, you will be disconnected from your heart and you will be kept alive only by machines. When you are reconnected again, you will awaken, but you will be paralyzed for six hours. Everything will seem strange to you. You won't be able to move. You won't be able to speak or open your eyes, but you will be conscious and you will be able to hear. And then she said this, I will be by your side, holding your hand as I am doing now. And I want you to know that I will be there until you are fully recovered. You will feel at times like you are totally helpless, but you can count on me. And you will know that I will not leave you even for one moment. So it is with God's call and the journey to which he has invited us. Would you pray with me? Oh God, I thank you for the men of faith who have made an incredible difference in our lives. Let us, Lord, learning by their teaching and their example to continue our journey to walk with you and to find your redemption. Amen. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. Faith of our fathers, living still, in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword, oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be Faith of our fathers we will love, both friend and foe, in all our strife, and preach thee to as love knows how, by kindly word and virtuous life. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will
Friends, thank you for joining us for worship today. As always, I invite you to take your phone, go down to the lower right-hand corner of your screen, put your phone over the QR code, follow the link. We would love to know that you are worshiping with us today. Please know that leaving your contact information with us is always optional. There are also opportunities there to serve, opportunities there to name persons who you would like for us to pray for, and opportunities to give. I thank you all for being a part of this worship experience, and I want you to know that we will continue to, to do this. At the moment, we're not exactly sure where our journey is going to take us next so that we can know what the gathering needs to be for, um, for persons who still want to join us for worship and want to serve and make this uh, a part of their uh, place of worship and a place to serve. So. We will be notifying you, but we will continue just simply to have this time of worship together. And I invite you each week to, to join us and to share in this time with us. And now I invite you to receive this benediction. And now may the peace of God be with you. May the love of God both strengthen you and sustain you. And may the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit keep us together forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.